Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Today we're going to be looking at malnutrition. This is going to be part one of two review lecture videos on malnutrition. The first part is aimed at introducing the topic and for the fifth year medical students and for the medical students that are looking at this topic for the first time, if by whatever chance you reach seventh year and you have never passed through malnutrition, then this is a good way for you to start. So if you actually have already gone through malnutrition and you just want to learn about the management as a final year student, please uh, skip it to the end of this video and go and watch part two of this video, which will just deal with management of malnutrition. So grab your piece of paper, your notepad, your pen, and let's go. So when I say the word malnutrition, most of the times what's going to come to your mind is a skinny child or a child that has lost significant amount of weight. But that's not really the case when we talk about malnutrition. Even overnutrition is a problem that's going to be affecting well-developed countries. But with the third world countries, undernutrition is much more common and a much more severe problem with a much greater incidence as compared to overnutrition. So remember that nutrition is pretty much the provision of adequate energy, nutrients, essential micro elements to meet the, mo the body's metabolic demands. And these essential nutrients cannot be synthesized by the body. So you cannot make vitamins in your body. There are some bacteria that live inside your gut that can make certain vitamins, such as vitamin K, but our own body cells cannot make vitamins. We cannot make minerals. We cannot make some amino acids, which are known as essential amino acids. We can make some fatty acids, which are known as essential fatty acids. And we can't make some essential carbohydrates. So these have to be taken in the diet. Then you have non-essential nutrients, which are, of course, synthesized from other compounds in the body. And uh, they may also be derived from the diet. Then you can divide nutrients into macronutrients which are pretty much going to be supplying energy and essential nutrients that are needed for growth development as well as disease prevention and activity and there are also some micronutrients which include things like minerals vitamins and some essential elements so when you talk about malnutrition this is just simply a cellular imbalance between the supply of nutrients and energy and the body's demand to ensure growth, maintenance, and specific function. That's a WHO, a World Health Organization, definition of what malnutrition is. So remember that when you talk about the types of malnutrition, we refer to both undernutrition and overnutrition. Most of the cases, when we think about malnutrition, we the first thing that comes to our mind is undernutrition because that's what is affecting most of the world, especially in the third world countries. So we could classify the types of malnutrition under un undernutrition, which is going to uh, encompass protein energy malnutrition, which we shall discuss at greater length. It also is going to entail things like micronutrient deficiencies. You may have overnutrition where an individual is overweight and obese, or these problems may coexist together. So you may have what is known as a double burden of malnutrition. So you may have obesity uh, together with protein energy malnutrition. You may also have obesity together with a micronutrient deficiency. Some individuals may have either acute malnutrition or chronic malnutrition. These are the different types of malnutrition. But we shall focus on undernutrition. And when we're talking about malnutrition in this setting, we shall be referring to undernutrition, not obesity. That shall be covered in another video later on on the channel. If you still haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe, hit the like button. It helps out the videos and also drop a comment to show some support. So we shall talk about undernutrition. So this is where an individual has inadequate consumption, either poor absorption or even excessive loss of these nutrients. They may even, they may even be taking 
um, the adequate amounts, but not the right types of foods. Picture this. If you're just taking one food type, suppose it's just starch every single day, then you end up lacking in these other areas. You lack certain essential elements. You lack certain other macronutrients. And then so we, when we say the term protein, energy, malnutrition and malnutrition, often we can use them interchangeably together with the word undernutrition. So I shall use these terms interchangeably with throughout this lecture when we're talking about malnutrition as well as protein, energy, malnutrition as well as undernutrition. So undernutrition is just simply a lack of macronutrients, which are going to be giving you energy through your calories and or a lack of micronutrients, which are going to be pretty much your vitamins and minerals. There are some essential vitamins in the body that we need that carry out certain functions. I shall mention them along the way. And remember that because these proteins are part of the immune system, immunoglobulins or antibodies are, are proteins, uh, complement proteins are proteins. And these have a very, very important function in the immune system. So it means that if someone has malnutrition, their immunity and their immune system is greatly impaired. That means that they are going to be susceptible to infections, especially things like sepsis, pneumonia, gastroenteritis. And what you need to note is that there are two types of undernutrition. There's what is known as protein energy malnutrition, which is going to be encompassing two severe forms. What, what is known as kwashioka, uh, which is pretty much a lack of protein, and marasmus, which is like total wasting, lack of both proteins and calories. Then you also have micronutrient deficiencies such as iron, iodine, and vitamin A, just to mention a few. So how do we classify malnutrition? We could use anthropometric measurements, basically weight and the height. So we could use the weight for age. If we know the age of the child, we can weigh the child. We could use height for age. And we can measure the height for the child if we know the, the age. But then if you don't know the age, it's best for you to use a weight for height because this doesn't require you to ask for the age. There are some eponym classifications like the Gomez classification, the Waterloo classification, as well as the Welcome classification. And then lastly, we'll talk about the WHO classification. So beginning with the basic groupings of malnutrition, so you could have a child that's wasted, you could have a child that's stunted, you could have a child that's underweight. So you should be able to distinguish between these three terms. I'll show you a picture in the next slide. So when you talk about wasting, this is just simply a child that's thin. So this child has actually uh, grown to a specific height for the uh, age, it's normal. So they have attained the normal height for their age. But then what happens is that they have begun to lose weight. They have reached a specific height, but they have started to lose weight. It could be because they are losing weight because they're not recently eating food or they are not absorbing their food from the gut or they have an illness. So this is a child that's going to be thin and this child is going to lose fat as well as muscle. So they're going to be having a low weight for height. That means that this low weight for height is going to be below minus two standard deviation of the median weight for height of their, of that population. This is very important because sometimes if you compare certain populations with each other, you'll find out that maybe one population generally they are taller than the other population. So you want to have a median from your own population. And of course, wasting is an indication of acute undernutrition. Then when you talk about stunting, this is a child that's going to be having a short stature and this child hasn't attained the height that they're supposed to have for a specific age. So it means that they're going to be having a low height for age, which is below um, two standard deviations of the median height of that population. And remember that this is a long-term process. It means that this child has been starved of this food for a very long time. And this often tends to be an indicator of chronic malnutrition. Then you get a, a child that weighs less than they're supposed to be weighing then you refer to that as underweight or undernourished. So this is a simply low weight for age. And take note that a child can actually be both wasted and stunted at the same time. So here's a pictorial image to help you understand this. So here we have a normal child who has a normal height, normal weight, and normal age. Then here you have a child that's wasted. You have a low weight for height. You have this child has attained the normal height that they are supposed to be for a specific age. But 
what has happened is that they have lost weight because of maybe an acute illness. So this is uh, going to be indicative of an acute problem. And then on the other hand here, this child hasn't reached the height that they are supposed to be, so they are stunted. So this is indicative of a, a chronic process. So this is going to be a low height for age. And then underweight, of course, is a low weight for age. So this is just someone, someone that has just lost weight. But of course, as you lose weight, you may um, become a bit shorter. Then we talk about the Gomez classification. So this was originally designed by Gomez and Galvin, who actually studied these Mexican children in about 1956. And they actually came up with this classification that was based on the percentage of the weight that is below a specified median for weight for age for that population so this classification wasn't so good because it didn't consider children that were overweight it also um um didn't consider height because uh, height alone may not be uh, the best indicator of malnutrition because if you look at a child that's uh, born prematurely then you may consider them as short for their age but despite them having a good Nutrition. So if we just use height alone, then it won't be a best indicator. So this classification works like this. So you have a, an actual a weight for age or sex that a child is supposed to be. Suppose a child is two years and you say at two years, hypothetically speaking, this child is supposed to weigh 10 kg. And then if they do not weigh 10 kg at two years and you weigh the child and you realize that they are 5 kg, so it means it'll be this child will be 50% uh, of their median uh, of that population. So that would be 50% of the desired body weight for age. So if this child attains between 90 to about 100, that's normal. If they attain between 75 to 89, that's known as mild protein energy malnutrition or grade one, or you may refer to it as a first degree. If it's between 60 to 74, you refer to that as second degree or grade two, or you could call it as a moderate, a protein energy malnutrition. If it's less than 60%, the scenario that I gave you, that's severe uh, protein energy malnutrition, and you refer to that as grade three or third degree. Then we move on to the Waterloo classification, which was a much newer classification that was designed by John Conrad Waterloo. So this classification combined weight for height, which is obviously going to be indicating acute malnutrition, like I told you earlier on, together with height for age, which is simply going to signify stunting as uh, an indication of chronic malnutrition. And the advantage of this Waterloo classification over the Gomez classification is that if you notice in this classification, you do not necessarily need to know the age of the child because you could just depend on the weight for height. But in the Gomez classification, you need to know the age of the child. So here are the percentages. So here we have stunting, height for age, and then here we have wasting, weight for height. So... A normal child who is at grade zero should be above 95. Height for age should be above 90 uh, weight for height. Then grade one, they should be between 87.5 to about 95%. And then on this other hand, 80 to 90. Then grade two, 80 to about 87.5. And then on this other hand, 70 to 80, then grade three or severe, less than 80, then here less than 70. So it takes some time to actually ingest these values and understand how these classifications work. Then when it comes to the welcome classification, the welcome classification is a clinical classification for children that are admitted in hospital, especially in a nutritional unit. So this is going to be using weight for age, and it's actually going to help us determine whether the child has kwashoka or marasmus or marasmic kwashoka, or they just have undernutrition. Of course, this uh, determination clinically doesn't have much of a significance because generally the management is the same. So if you get a child and you find their weight for age, and it's between 60 to 80% of the expected weight, if they have edema, then you refer to that as kwashoka. If they do not have edema, then you refer to that as undernutrition. If you find the weight of this child and you compare it to the expected weight for age, and you realize that it's less than 60% of the expected weight for age, then if they have edema, you refer to that as marasmic kwashoka. Remember that kwashoka, the hallmark of it is that there's going to be edema. The reason why there's going to be edema is because there's hypoproteinemia, there's hypoalbuminemia. So the oncotic pressure has decreased inside the blood vessels. And 
it means that blood is no longer be, or water that has left the blood vessels is no longer being pulled back into the bloodstream. So most of it is trapped in the peripheries. Then if this child is a less than 60% and they do not have edema, you refer to that as marasmus. And then when it comes to the WHO classification, which is much more extensive and what we use to actually classify children under severe acute malnutrition, I shall give you the parameters very shortly. But what we use are the weight for height Z scores or the standard deviation scores. We use the mid upper arm circumference and we also use the presence of edema for this classification. I'll give you a table after we've discussed each of these parameters. So... The WHO actually recommends that we use the Z scores or the standard deviation scores to actually evaluate some of these anthropometric data. So how you calculate the Z scores, you get the observed value, then you subtract the median reference value, then you divide by the standard deviation of the reference population that you're dealing with. Of course, in your exams, they may give you these values, but most of the times they do give you a table that you could easily work out from. So I'll give you a practical example very shortly. So if you find your SD scores and you find out that someone is at minus one, then they have mild malnutrition. If they're between minus two to minus three, then they have moderate malnutrition. If they are less than minus three, then they have severe malnutrition. If they have greater than positive three standard deviation, then they have obesity. So here's a practical example of how you could use this in an exam setting. So you get a three-year-old that comes in with a history of recurrent oral sores and cough for about three weeks. And with the weight and uh, night sweat, weight loss and night sweats for a month, so this could be TB, who knows? So the weight of about 8 kg and a height of about 82 centimeters. The MUAC was 9 centimeters and there was no edema. Work out the weight for height standard deviation using the available chart. So they may give you, they will give you this chart during your exam if they actually bring you such a question. So what you simply do here is you ensure that you what the chart that you're using here is obviously for the right gender. So they usually indicate whether it's for a boy or a girl. And in this case, they've only given us this chart. So we assume that it's for the sex of the child. Then you come here and you'll see that over here you have length. If you're going towards the left here, you have the negatives. You're going towards the right here, you have the positives. And of course, you have your median, your minus one, minus two, minus three, and minus four. So this child is uh, has a height of 82 centimeters. So we come over here and we say 82 centimeters. But then this child is weighing 8 kg. So if we trace where 8 kg is, 8 kg is going to be between minus 3 here to minus 4. So you have minus 4 being 7.9 as a threshold. So when you get to 8 here, that means you're spilling over to minus 3. So this child is at minus 3 standard deviation. So they are at severe acute malnutrition or they have severe malnutrition so when we use some of these age dependent indices such as the muac we can also use this in the who classification remember that this weight um these other examples are pretty much dependent on the age of the child while as the muac is not really dependent on the age of the child that's why i refer to it as an age independent indice so the MUAC is just simply the mid upper arm circumference. It usually tends to increase when the child is um, one year. So it will increase to about 11 to 16. And then it's going to be stabilizing between the ages of one to five at a value of about 16 to about 17 centimeters. In your room, you can actually, if you have a measuring tape, try measuring your MUAC and try to find out if you have malnutrition. I am only joking. So if you get a MUAC value that's less than 13.5, then you refer to that as a, a feature that's suggestive of malnutrition. They may not necessarily have malnutrition, but they have the risk factors of developing malnutrition. Any value that you get below 11.5, as in the previous example that I showed you, that's already pointing you towards severe malnutrition. So the methods that we could use to measure the MUAC or determine the MUAC, we could use your non-elastic measuring tape as a student on the words this is probably what you're going to be using if you do not find the shakia tape to measure the muac so pretty much look at the olecranon of um, the elbow here of the owner and then uh, from uh, here the acromion of the scapula then of course half the distance then you measure it in this manner like that that's going to be 
your muac or you could use your secure tape which has these special colors as you can see it has green here if you fall under the green it means you're between a 13.5 and above so that's okay that's normal then if you fall between 12.5 to 13.5 that's borderline so you have a risk of developing malnutrition and then if you fall below 11.5 then you obviously have um, malnutrition then you could also do a bangle test. So you get a bangle that has an internal diameter of about four centimeters, and then you pass it above the elbow. So in a severely malnourished child, it can easily pass above the elbow. But in a normal child, you can't pass it above the elbow. Then another age-independent index is the skin fold thickness. So um, this is actually going to help you determine the subcutaneous fat. Usually we measure the tricep skin fold, which is actually most representative of the total subcutaneous fat up until someone reaches the age of 16. Beyond this, it becomes very unreliable because it varies greatly with the population. So usually it's supposed to be above 10. So if it falls below 6 or below 10, then you should be worried. So here's the WHO classification. If I combine everything that I've been talking to you about, if I combine the work as well as the weight for height Z scores. So if you get um, someone who does not have malnutrition, the work is supposed to be greater than 13.5. Their weight for height is supposed to be greater than minus 1 SD. And of course, someone with mild malnutrition that's at risk is going to be having a work of 12.5 to about 13.4. And their weight for height scores will be between minus 2 to minus 1. So this is mild. Then moderate would be between 11.5 to 12.4. And then their SD scores would be minus 2 to minus 3. Then severe malnutrition would be less than 11.5, less than minus 3 SD. And they will have bipedal edema, which is, of course, pitting edema. Now, speaking of severe acute malnutrition, we won't talk about the, the mild and the moderate types because they're not really... Um, indications for us to actually admit the children but with severe acute malnutrition we always want to admit the children depending on what they're going to be presenting with so in most cases most children are between the ages of six months to about 59 months but i know this tends to be very difficult for students to remember so that's why i often tell them children that are falling between the brackets of six months and six years so below six months malnutrition is very uncommon it sometimes happens, but rarely. Above six, above six years, it's also very uncommon. It also happens, but quite rarely. So you get a weight for height that's below minus 3 SD of the median WHO growth reference. You get a MUAC that is 11, less than 11.5. Remember that below six months, MUAC is pretty much useless. So we do not use it in the diagnostic criteria if you're suspecting malnutrition in a child that's less than six months. And of course, severe visible wasting and as well as the presence of bipedal edema. So remember that malnutrition in a child that's less than six months, not so common. The only thing that may point you towards this is if the severe visible visible wasting, bipedal edema, a weight for height that's less than minus three, the standard deviation, and of course, if the infant is actually showing signs that they are too weak or they are feeble to actually suck effectively. Certain causes of malnutrition could be divided as maternal causes or child uh, causes or child factors. So the maternal or paternal factors uh, pretty much lie in the ability of them to actually provide um, food for their family and to, to provide food for the child. So pretty much if they have a low so socioeconomic status as well as availability of food, it means that obviously the child won't be having the foods already or you're not having the three standard meals that a child is supposed to be having, then some cultural taboos may actually, re, um, regarding foods, may actually stop a child from having certain meals. There are certain crazy beliefs out there. Then, of course, access to health, even water and sanitation, this may have a bearing on the health of the child. The educational level of the family, especially the mother or the caregiver of the child. So if a mother is not so educated, then the uh, chances of them coming in with malnutrition are much higher than an educated mother. Then, of course, in, in large families and where there is a poor spacing between the children because there may be some neglect. So they may sometimes give you a clinical scenario where you get a mother that's pregnant and she has a one-year-old child, and then the one-year-old child is not to take care of that one-year-old child. That one-year-old child then comes in with malnutrition. You're not surprised because there's neglect. The mother is pregnant. She can't take care of three people 
in essence. And then, you know, of course, with large families, of course, that also comes down to providing food, even though the, the parents may be able to provide the food, but how much would you provide for a family? Let's, let's say, for example, 12 children. And then you may also have health access. You may have um, poor access to uh, certain health facilities. Like, for example, if a child gets sick recurrently, then this may tip them into malnutrition. Then with the child factors, you may start off as early as birth. So if a child is uh, has a low birth weight, infants that are born small usually tend to remain small. That's the rule of thumb. Then it, it's not always like that. If you feed them right, sometimes they do catch up. Then you may have inadequate dietary intakes. That could be due to maybe a delayed uh, complementary feeding and inadequate intake of food. Like, for example, job uh, or food av availability in the family. Then you may sometimes have insufficient quality of food. This is very important. You get a mother who says, no, I do feed this child about five times a day. But then you ask her, what do you feed this child? And she tells you something that doesn't have that much nutritional value. So quality, not only quantity is important, but quality is important as well, as well as a variety of foods. And then, of course, you should also ensure that you ask if the family actually eats together. Because in a group where a family is eating together, you get some chaps that eat pretty much like Usain Bolt very quickly. And then you get those children that do not eat so fast. So if they're eating together, then you find out that this child that's not eating so fast is going to be um, presenting with malnutrition. And of course, certain infections such as diarrhea, pneumonias uh, are going to be consuming energy because energy is needed for the immune system to fight these infections. So they may hamper growth. They may have some nutritional losses in the stool. Other diseases like measles, very important. A TB, very important. HIV and other chronic illnesses that may affect the child may tip this child into malnutrition. Now, when you get a child that's severely malnourished, severe acute malnutrition or SAM, you could divide it into two groups. You have an uncomplicated SAM and complicated SAM. So in uncomplicated SAM, you get a child that's older than six months, the usual case. If the child is alert, that's, that's uncomplicated. That's a good sign. If the appetite is okay, that's a good sign. If they clinically, you assess them and they seem to be well, no other illness that's there, that's a good sign. So it means that this child, if this child is living in a conducive environment, they could actually be managed from home as an outpatient basis. But very few times a child will come in with fitting all these criteria here. Then with with complicated SAM, usually in children less than six months, because it's a very rare thing to occur, sometimes if the child is not alert, then this may hint you that this may be complicated SAM. If they are having loss of appetite, please admit them to the hospital and take care of them in the hospital. And of course, if they are above six months and clinically they're just not well, you want to manage them in a hospital. So they should be admitted. Then there are forms of SAM of protein energy or protein energy malnutrition. There are two main forms which are known as kwashoka, which is pretty much inadequate protein intake, and marasmus, which is pretty much an inadequate intake of uh, proteins as well as calories. So you can think of this as a total caloric deficiency. So even though we have these differences between kashoka and marasmus, some studies are actually suggesting that marasmus is actually going to be representing a form of adaptation to starvation. Remember that whenever you starve your body from getting food, the first thing that's going to happen is that you're going to use up the glycogen in your liver, probably in the few hours, glycogen is going to be converted to glucose and you use it up. The next source that your body is going to turn to are obviously the fats. So fats are going to be broken down. Beta oxidation is going to take place and you'll use fats as an alternative source of fuel. Then once the fats have been used up, then the last thing to go are indeed your proteins. And once you now start using up your your proteins, then your body has to reach a state where it adapts. Certain body functions have to slow down to accommodate for this new state that you have found, which is what happens in marasmus. Then in kwashoka, there's usually a, a disadaptation to this starvation. So clinically, like I already told you, it's not so important to distinguish between these two because the management underlying uh, kwashoka as well as marasmus is largely the same. And sometimes you may have marasmic kwashoka, which is a mixed form of um, that manifests with both edema occurring in children who may or may not have some signs of a kwashoka. And sometimes they may also have a varying signs of marasmus. 
So here's a picture of a child that has kwashoka. So usually it's going to be affecting children that are between the ages of one to four. So the main sign that's going to be there is edema. They're going to have edema because their liver, because they're losing proteins, they're losing albumin. So they'll be having hypoalbuminemia. So if they have hypoalbuminemia, it means that the oncotic pressure of blood has reduced. And remember that there are two forces across a blood vessel. You have oncotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is just pretty much the pressure of any substance that uh, exerts, um, or you can think of it like this. It's uh, the pressure that's exerted by a substance that is enclosed in a container. So if you put water in a cup, the water molecules are going to exert a pressure on the cup. You refer to that as a hydrostatic pressure. Same thing with the blood. The pressure that the blood exerts on the blood vessels is known as hydrostatic pressure. It tends to push fluid out of um, the vascular compartment. Then there's, an other, there's another pressure that's known as an osmotic pressure that tends to pull fluid into the vascular space. That's known as osmotic pressure. You have a special type of osmotic pressure that's known as oncotic pressure which is due to the proteins. Now you get this child that's using up these proteins and they have low concentration of albumin, which is of course the most abundant plasma protein, then you're going to decrease this oncotic pressure and there'll be an imbalance, an imbalance between hydrostatic pressure, which pushes fluid outwards and oncotic pressure, which draws fluid back in. So this child ends up losing more fluid than they are retaining fluid in their blood, um, blood, vascular space so it means that there's going to be edema that may be there and this edema may actually be confusing because you may actually feel like as if this child has a normal nutrition and is actually obese so that's why they refer to these as sugar babies or fat sugar babies because of their appearance they, they do not seem like as if they are malnourished quote unquote but they may have features of wasting as well they may have liver enlargement which is obviously due to deposition of fats there because of um, a defect that's happening in synthesis of uh, the lipoproteins so it means that uh, triglycerides and all these other fat um derivatives are going to be depositing in the liver and they may cause enlargement of the liver. Sometimes you may have steatosis. You may also have depigmentation of the skin as well as the hair. And remember the edema is going to be rain, ranging from mild to actually gross edema and may actually represent about 5 to 20% of the body weight. And then, the, like I told you, there may be muscle wasting that may be present. And often these children are quite weak. They are hypotonic and they may actually be unable to stand or even walk. Then with marasmus, the word marasmus just simply means to waste away. So this is a child that has this rapid deterioration in their nutritional status. They may have acute starvation or they may have had this acute illness um, over a borderline nutritional status. So this could um, precipitate them to go into a form of undernutrition, which is known as marasmus. Of course, it's going to be characterized by this marked loss of fat as well as muscle uh, tissue because this is going to be used um, to provide energy. So remember that the main sign that's going to be there in marasmus is wasting. So this child is going to be appearing very thin. They're going to be um, having their fat pads, their subcutaneous fat pads lost. So even in their cheeks, they'll be lost. Even at the buttocks, they'll be lost. So their buttocks may actually sag like that. You refer to this as a a baggy pants appearance. Sometimes, as you can see, this this baby looks like an old man. They used to refer to this as an old man's face, but do not refer to that uh, right now as an old man's face or a monkey face. We do not use those terms. They are quite derogatory. And you don't want to call anyone... Um, as having a monkey face then of course they also lose this axillary fat pads um they are also going to be quite alert as compared to the children that have kwashoka which are apathic and they're not so alert there's no edema in marasmus so here's a comparative table that compares the features of marasmus on one side and the features of kwashoka you can actually pause the video right now and go through this table and actually understand what's going on in this table i will not spend so much time here because this video will be unduly long so here are some of the clinical features that may be there with protein energy malnutrition so we i like to tackle things coming from head to toe so what's happening in the head coming down like in that manner so if you look at the face we may have moon face so in kwashoka we may have a simian face but we do not refer to it as a simian face in marasmus because this is a very bad term to use if we look at the eyes the eyes may dry may be dry there may be some um, pale conjunctiva because of anemia there may be some bite at spots because of vitamin a deficiency this may actually be a prelude to a corneal ulceration as well as a perforation of the cornea 
then they may have periorbital edema, they may have angular stomatitis, chelitis, glossitis, spongy bleeding gums, that's scurvy due to vitamin C deficiency, parotid enlargement. When you come to the teeth, they may have mottling of the enamel, they may have delayed eruptions. When you come to the hair, it may be dull, it may be sparse, it may be brittle, it may be hypopigmented, and then you may also have these alternating bands of light as well as normal colored hair, which is known as a flag sign. Sometimes you may have this broomstick eyelash you may have alopecia which is loss of hair and you overally the hair will be much thinner than it's supposed to be because you need keratin to um, be synthesized and keratin is a protein and you do not have proteins in the body so when you look at the skin you may get this loose and um, wrinkled um, skin in the cases of marasmus it may be shiny and edematous in kwashoka it may be dry there may be follicular hyperkeratosis there may be patchy hyper and hyperpigmentations or hypopigmentations there may be erosions there may be poor wound healing there may be coilonychia in the nails which is the spoon shaped nails the the nails may be thin they may be soft and there may be fissures even ridges on the nails if you look at the masculature there will be muscle wasting of course affecting mostly the buttocks as well as the thighs you may have skeletal muscle d or oh, the skeletal deformities due to deficiencies in calcium, vitamin D, as well as vitamin C. You may have abdominal distension, which may be due to hepatomegaly in a fatty liver. It may be due to ascites as well, even due to poor uh, musculature or poor tone of the abdominal muscles. You may have a bradycardia, hypotension, reduced cardiac up output as well as small vessel vasculopathies in cardiovascular system you may have global developmental delays in the neurological system so there may be loss of the knee and the ankle reflexes sometimes even a poor memory then in the hematological system you may have pallor petechiae and bleeding diathesis you may have a behavioral changes such as apathy lethargy even the baby may be anxious so as you can see there are many clinical features of malnutrition take some time to actually know them we'll, i'll go through the important ones in each slide coming up right next so if you look at the hair changes so a hair of a malnourished child is obviously going to be dull it will lose that shininess it will be hypopigmented and there may be some dispigmentation so it loses its characteristic curls and it's going to be sparse so there's going to be some balding that may be there in the temporal region there may be balding in the occipital region and remember that Keratin synthesis is going to be impaired because keratin is a protein and you do not have cysteine and you do not have methionine because they are deficient. So it means that the hair is going to be brittle and it can easily be pulled off. It can easily break off. And of course, the pigment melanin that's formed from an amino acid, which is known as tyrosine, is also going to be deficient. So the hair is going to lose its color and then it's going to become reddish or gray. And then you, And then if this child has these periods of good nutrition, alternating with periods of poor nutrition, you may get what is known as a flag sign where you have these alternating bands of hypopigmented as well as normal pigmented hair then of course you may have dullness and lack of luster due to weathering of the hair cuticle then when it comes to the to the eye signs these are largely due to vitamin a deficiency so they may have photophobia so please keep the eyes of the child closed and give them vitamin a in the management we'll talk of that you may have a dry conjunctiva uh, or cornea you may have bitot spots. So these are bitot spots. These foamy like material that you can see here that's growing in the um, scleral part of the eye. So these are known as bitot spots. These are early signs of vitamin A deficiency. The earliest sign obviously would be your um, decrease in vision at night. So night blindness. But of course you can ask a baby that can't talk. If they have night blindness, that would be very awkward. Then, of course, they may have corneal ulceration as well as um, keratomalacia. In the neurological system, they may have apathy. So generally, they are unhappy. They are apathic. Sometimes they may be irritable with a sad, intermittent cry. Of course, they show no signs of hunger, and it's very difficult to feed them. So in, this is seen often in Kwashoka. Remember, marasmus, they are pretty active. So this may be due to maybe hypokalemia because hypokalemia is going to be causing muscle weakness. It may also cause easy fatigability of the muscles. It may also be due to lack of stimulation as well as deprivation that may cause a reduction in the growth of the brain as well as the nerves. And this is going to lead to mental slowing. You may also have these mental or neurological manifestations due to zinc deficiency or generally because the basal metabolic rate has 
decreased. Now, in the cardiovascular as well as the hematological system, this child may have this cold, uh, pale extremities. Obviously, this is due to circulatory collapse or uh, circulatory insufficiency. So it may also be associated with a prolonged uh, circulatory time. So if you examine this child, this child may be lethargic or even unconscious with cold peripheries. They may have a delayed capillary refill time that's greater than three seconds. They may have a weak rapid pulse and a low blood pressure because they have a diminished uh, cardiac output. Then they may also have signs of dehydration. So these are going to be including things like hypovolemia or septic shock. Remember that your typical star signs of dehydration are not really reliable in a malnourished child. So those things like a sunken eyes, things like loss of elasticity, those changes are already there in malnourished child. So they're not quite reliable to use in uh, determining whether the child is dehydrated or not. So we always assume that they are dehydrated if they have vomited or if they have any history of passing uh, diarrhea or passing stool. So... If they are uh, severely pale, this is obviously due to anemia. And if they have signs of congestive cardiac failure, this may be due to cardiogenic shock. Remember that um, the problem of the heart is often due to selenium deficiency, which obviously leads to a reduction in the cardiac muscle function. And then the anemia may be due to things like iron deficiency, which is not there in the diet, folic acid. You may even have vitamin B12 deficiencies. You may have some parasitic infestations such as hookworms. You may have malabsorption that may recur due to um, recurrent diarrhea as well as inadequate intake of copper. Then in the gastrointestinal system, you may have some mucosal lesions, such as a smooth tongue. You may have chelosis. You may have angular stomatitis, which are obviously due to these nutritional deficiencies. You may have herpes simplex stomatitis, which may also be seen. Generally, anorexia and sometimes vomiting may be present. You may have abdominal distension. The stool that this children are going to be passed usually is going to be watery or semi-solid. Usually, the, it's uh, bulky with a very low pH and contains these unabsorbed sugars. This may be also the reason why they tend to have diarrhea because they trap these um, osmotically active substances in their gut so this tend to pull more water into their gut that may cause their diarrhea the other reason could be that they have these recurrent infections due to their decreased immunity remember that they have less iga which is supposed to have given you this mucosal protection and they also decrease the secretion of acid so it means that they can get infection and they may have diarrhea they may also have malabsorptive um, conditions they may have pancreatic enzyme deficiencies and pancreatic atrophy as well as uh, some protein deficiencies so it means it makes up absorption very difficult and then also you may have a zinc deficiency which is needed for functioning of the GIT and re -epithelialization. They may have a pot belly, which is obviously due to hypotonic muscle walls of the abdomen. It may be due to paralytic ileus that may be caused by hypokalemia or even bacterial overgrowth that may be due to the decrease in immunity. You may also have hepatomegaly due to a free radical damage to the reticular endothelial system that may cause actually a decrease in protein synthesis in the liver. You may also have a beta lipoprotein deficiency that may result in accumulation of triglycerides, as I told you earlier on. Some skin changes are going to be including things like a flaky paint dermatosis you, where you have these hyperpigmentations as well as disquamation over raw skin. You may have um, this due to deficiencies in zinc as well as niacin. You may have what is known as crazy pavement dermatosis, which is, drew, which is going to manifest as a dry hyperkeratotic as well as fissured skin that may alter it up alternate with the hyper as well as hypopigmentations. Sometimes you may have a mixture of various lesions. So this is what's known as a mosaic a dermatosis. You may have atrophy of the sweat glands. Even the lacrimal glands may sometimes atrophy. So that's why I say that it's very difficult to judge with those features of dehydration. Because if the lacrimal gland atrophies, then it means that... Um, they're not going to be producing the tears. And even when they cry, there won't be uh, excessive tears. So there may sometimes be excessive drying of the skin. They may have acrodermatitis enteropathica, which is obviously due to a deficiency in zinc. They may have some skin changes that are seen over the perineum, the groin, the limbs, behind the ears, and in the armpits. So we can actually grade the dermatosis. So if you get a mouth, this is someone who just pretty much has discoloration or a few rough patches of skin. Someone who has moderate, they have these multiple patches on the arms and the legs. Then, of course, severe would be things like flaking of the skin, raw skin, fissuring, even opening up of the skin. Sometimes a child may waste. This is obviously due to calorie deficiency. Remember that the fats are going to be used up 
uh, proteins are going to be used up for energy. You may also have these recurrent infections and remember that infections need energy to be fought against. Then you may have other associated infections like HIV wasting syndrome as well as TB. So some features that are going to be pointing you towards wasting is that you're able to easily see the rib outlines of the child. And of course, the skin of the upper arm looks very loose. The ribs and the shoulders can be easily seen, like I said. You also have this flesh that's missing on the buttock. You have this baggy pant appearance. And then you have loss of this subcutaneous uh, tissue on the cheeks and the fats, which was previously referred to as the monkey faces. Then you may have edema sometimes. This is obviously due to Kwashoka uh, with a protein deficiency hypoalbuminemia. I already explained this with uh, the decrease in oncotic pressure. You may also have hypovolemia due to the diarrhea. Remember that whenever there's hypovolemia, then blood is not really perfusing the kidneys. There's a reduction in the glomerular filtration rate. And of course, this activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And long story short, there's water retention that happens. So that's how the edema is coming about. You may sometimes have this free radical damage to the cell membrane where you damage the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Then the sodium accumulates. Remember, wherever sodium goes, water follows. Then sometimes you may have increase in the level of leukotrienes, which are going to be causing uncontrolled vasodilatation, hypovolemia, as well as increased tubular reabsorption of salt and water in the kidneys. Then you may grade this edema. So if it's affecting both ankles up to the ankle level and the feet, you refer to that as mild. If it's uh, both feet uh, plus the lower legs and the hands with the arms, then you refer to this as a moderate. If it's severe, <coughs> then you are referring to to edema that's affecting the limbs as well as the trunk. And then, of course, a very severe is going to be affecting, for example, uh, the whole body. So on Asaka, some books will just give you three classifications, mild, moderate, and severe. Then these children also are predisposed to having these recurrent infections. That's because of this decrease in this immune response. That's obviously due to this inability to synthesize things like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, the tumor necrosis factor alpha, due to, of course, lack of these essential amino acids. You may also have these deficiencies in complements like C3, C5, as well as factor B, which are needed for opsonization and phagocytosis. So these are going to reduce opsonization. They're also going to be reducing phagocytosis. You may have a decreased phagocytic as well as bactericidal activity of leukocytes due to um, NADPH oxidase, as well as disocyme deficiencies. And like I told you, most glands usually atrophy. So you may also have atrophy of the thymolymphatic gland which is obviously going to be causing a depletion in the T cells and of course a depression in the cell mediated immunity. So it means that they're predisposed to infections like herpes, even infections like candida. So this immunosuppression that is seen in malnutrition because malnutrition is a a form or a cause of immunosuppression is very similar to what we see in HIV and AIDS. So there's going to be a loss of the delayed uh, hypersensitivity or the delayed uh, the cell mediated immunity there are going to be a few T lymphocytes there'll be an impaired lymphocytic response there'll be impaired phagocytosis obviously this is secondary to the complement um, deficiencies that I told you about and of course certain cytokines and a decrease in secretory IgA. So remember that this is going to be predisposing the child to get in this recurrent infections. And remember that the infections need energy to be fought against. So it means that the energy that this child doesn't have is going to be needed to fight this infection. So we're going to now use up more of the body. We use up more of the proteins to fight off this um infection and then this infection keeps persisting and then obviously we lack the nutrition so we create this vicious cycle that doesn't end then there are some micronutrients that may be there so so they may be deficient iron which may result in microcytic anemia so they may have uh, fatigue anemia decreased cognitive function headaches glossitis coelonychia they may also have a folate deficiency so they may have glossitis anemia which is megaloblastic anemia some neurotube defects in a much older women uh, that give uh, that have folate deficiencies they give birth to children with these neurotube deficiencies or these neurotube um, defects rather then you may also have iodine a deficiency which may cause goiter as well as developmental delays and cognitive impairment remember that iodine is needed for brain development then zinc may cause anemia dwarfism hepatosplenomegaly hyperpigmentation hypogonadism acrodermatitis enteropathica uh, diminished immune responses or poor wound healing the zinc may also uh, be important in rehydration as well as refeeding process there's a complication of um 
malnutrition, which is known as refeeding syndrome, which we shall look at a bit later on. Then urinary zinc is uh, proportional to the overall zinc status. Then with vitamin A, you may get night, bl night blindness in the children that can talk. Then you may sometimes get xerophthalmia, which is, um, of course, this drying that may be affecting the eye. You may get uh, keratinous changes of the cornea, as well as this conjunctiva, the bite of spots. You may get skin keratinizations. You may get poor growth and hair changes. You may get vitamin D deficiencies, so you may have poor growth. You may have rickets. You may also uh, have hypocalcemia. So when you're assessing a child that comes in with malnutrition, you want to take your history so you want to assess the past and the present diet you want to do examination so focus a lot on the anthropometrics you also want to do some lab investigations and the lab investigations that we do usually are just essential for uh, detection of the early physiological adaptation to malnutrition and for us to pick up certain diseases so we want to do a full blood count to check for any anemia to check for any infections and there may be a low lymphocytic count indicating of course an impaired cellular immunity then we may want to do also an ESR which may indicate that there's an, an underlying inflammatory process you may do a malaria slide a thick or a thin smear you may also do blood cultures urea and electrolytes you are, you are interested in calcium magnesium phosphate which may be low you also do sodium and potassium you may also want to do creatinine you may do an hiv test you may cross match their blood you may uh, order for some liver enzymes you may order for total proteins but specifically serum albumin you may also order a clotting profile you may also take some assays for specific minerals and vitamins if you so wish then you may also order a thyroid, a thyroid function test. So you may get low T3, T4, and high TSH. So that's uh, pretty much um, the um, thyroid glands are not producing T3 and T4 because they do not have the raw materials. Then you may sometimes do your urine for microscopy, culture, and sensitivity for terms of infections. You want to do your gastric lavage for your acid fast bacilli for TB obviously you want to do your stool studies for any GI infections and other investigations depend largely on your history and what this child is going to be presenting with like for example if they're presenting with signs of meningitis then you want to do your lumbar puncture and your CSF analysis if they are presenting to you with features of pneumonia you want to do your chest x-ray so here's a summary of everything that I've been talking about. So your anthropometric, your weight, your height, your MUAC, and your skin folds. Then your laboratory, your plasma albumin, which may be low, and some specific minerals and vitamins. And of course, on your history, do not forget to check your dietary um, intake and the food intake that this child is taking in. And also remember that there is some immunodeficiency that is associated with malnutrition. So there may be a low lymphocyte count as well as impaired cellular immunity. Now, last but not least, I won't go into details of this. So for the fifth year class, this is just going to be an overview of what the management is all about. For the seventh year um, class, then you should watch the next video on malnutrition. So generally, the treatment is going to be involving 10 steps, which are divided into three phases. Some literature only give you two phases, the stabilization phase, which is usually the initial phases where they are the dangerous things that can kill the child. Then you have the rehabilitation phase where you are getting this child back to normal. So you have the stabilization phase, transition phase, and rehabilitation phase. So the 10 steps are as follows. So you want to treat and prevent hypoglycemia. You want to treat and prevent hypothermia. You want to treat and prevent dehydration, electrolyte imbalances, infections, and you want to give some micronutrients. You initiate some initiation feeds. Then you want to also give catch-up feeds. The initiation feeds are F75 or formula 75. Then catch up feeds is F100. Then you want to also give some sensory stimulation and prepare this child for follow up. So here are the days where we give this. So within the first two days, as you can see, hypoglycemia can kill the child. Hypothermia can kill the child. Dehydration can kill the child. Electrolyte imbalances can kill the child. Infections can kill the child. So these are the five things that can kill the child within the first 24 hours then you also want to give some micronutrients because the it, there is a possibility of infections happening we want to put off giving iron in the first week and then obviously give iron towards week two going on because if we give iron iron bacteria use iron for growth so they may grow out of control and you may worsen the situation then of course initiation feeds catch up feeds after they are tolerating the initiating feeds very well then of course sensory stimulation throughout the process give them toys to play with interact stimulate their minds and of course prepare to discharge them from the hospital 
Thank you for taking your time to listen to this very long lecture on malnutrition. I hope you really understood the topic because it's a very, very important topic. Stay tuned for part two on the subject. If you still haven't yet subscribed, please subscribe, share these videos to an individual that may be helped from these videos. My name is Dr.